Yes, that's, that's me. I want to start with thanks and with apologies. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come to Finland and to Helsinki. Helsinki, as I'll mention, is one of the most inspirational cities for smart city ideas in Europe. Uh, so it's a pleasure to come here and see so many things that I've only heard about before. The apology, uh, one is for speaking in English. Uh, I'm Scottish, uh, so you may detect a slight accent, just slight. And I'm also very passionate about this, this stuff. So if I begin to speed up, I'll try and slow down again. Uh, I'm used to speaking to Japanese audiences, uh, so whatever your reaction is, it's bound to feel like hysteria coming towards me. Uh, I'll do a, a quick run through. I want to speak about cities because so many of the challenges that face cities now are the same challenges that face your buildings. And dealing with them in the same intelligent manner uh, is something that gives us a step forward uh, in terms of making our users happy. Uh, I'll talk about some of the challenges to smart cities and the drivers, and I'll try and get across the point that the drivers to this change are very real. They're not theoretical. They are things that are happening just now. I'll mention a few things that are actually happening, uh, mostly in Japan, but coming to Europe now. Things that you'll see in the city, which will be reflected in buildings. Uh, and then talk a little bit about smart creation and co-creation. Now, I'm not the expert on smart buildings. I'm seeing those people in the room just now. So I'll ask some questions that I hope to hear answered uh, as we go through today. And I've also been told that I will be uh, pulled off after 25 minutes, so I'll try and keep that short. Uh, first, as I was saying about Helsinki, uh, you are already in many ways a smart city. And a lot of places do not realize there's a link between a city and the region that sits around about it. We'll talk a little bit about urbanization and how many people are flooding into cities. But every person who comes to a city leaves the hinterland. They leave the countryside, they leave those smaller towns. And part of being smart is dealing with that. It's keeping your people, making you attractive uh, to those folk who would otherwise go to the bright lights. Uh, I'm loving uh, Kalasa Kalasatawa. I only found out about it when I came here. The idea of having a 25-hour day. It's a 25-7 city, not 24-7. Because they will save you an hour you would otherwise spend doing boring tasks or doing purposeless tasks and give you that hour back to do the things that you're passionate about. I, I love that idea. And I'm a member of the Mobility as, as a Service uh, board in Scotland. A lot of the ideas we take for smart transport, for mobility as a service, were pioneered here uh, in Helsinki and in the hinterland throughout Finland. So it is, a, it is a pleasure to be here. And I know that I'm not telling you things that are completely new, that these are things that you already know. So. Uh, it's, apps, it's a law that a smart city presentation must start with the definition of what a smart city is. I've had two or three day conferences which were entirely dedicated to defining what a smart city is and did nothing else. So although the ISO is the internationally uh, recognized definition, I go with my colleague Patricia uh, who told me that a smart city is one that is easier to live in, that we make the city an easier place to be in more attractive, uh, something which will bring people in rather than make them think about all of the, the bad things about living in a city. Uh, the challenges I spoke about uh, and why they're real, we know there's population growth. It's fairly stable in some parts of Europe, uh, but we're still looking at in the region of two Earths by 2030. We don't have two Earths available. Uh, we're still looking at 43 billion tonnes of CO2 being released, uh, and we're still looking at that 8.3 billion population. Uh, all of those are challenges that have to be met in smart ways, because we're not going anywhere else. Uh, despite uh, Elon Musk trying to send us to Mars, I think this is where all our eggs are, uh, and we have to face these challenges. Uh, to go into a little bit more detail, uh, in global warming, uh, unless we have smart energy, unless we have energy uh, monitoring and maintenance in our own homes and in our buildings, then that is what we face. Uh, at the moment, 32.6 billion tonnes of CO2. We're trying to move from fossil fuels. We're trying to look at carbon capture. But at the moment, 
the real challenge and the thing we can actually face is how we deal with that in our smart buildings, in our smart cities, and it's an individual responsibility. It's not just a government one. The traffic congestion and jams, uh, there was a survey in San Francisco which showed that 30% of people who are driving around the city are looking for a parking space. Not doing something useful, just looking for somewhere they can store a car. So think of 30% of the emissions that we're putting out are totally fruitless. Uh, one of the reasons I'm glad to be in Finland is talking about the aging population. And because Finland has one of the healthiest and most rapidly aging populations in Europe, which is not an issue, uh, it's a fantastic thing, but it is a challenge. And I'll talk a little bit about how we brought this in from Japan, where they're also facing having more and more people over 60. I think the figure is, uh, and you see it in the streets, one, over, one in three people in Tokyo is aged over 60. Uh, when I went there, I was amazed that before 8 o'clock, the streets are thronged. Uh, around about 9 o'clock, when people go into their offices, it gets quiet. And then the city comes awake again, and you have a third of those people walking around and using facilities uh, that you'd normally only associate with rush hour here. It's, it's fascinating to see. Uh, security, and here, kind of focusing on big scale environmental disasters, the sort of thing that you did see in Japan with our tidal wave, which led to the problem uh, with the nuclear meltdown, near nuclear meltdown. Those problems show in a smaller way in some, other, uh, in some other countries. I believe that, like the UK, Finland will occasionally have flooding problems, and we have to look at how we mitigate them, both for cities, for buildings, for individuals. Moving on. So these are, these are real drivers. They're, they're not things that are invented. They're not things we can turn around. Those are actually making it necessary that we be, we be smart. Uh, I love the optimism of places like China and India. Uh, India is going to put together 50 smart cities of 15 million people in the next 20 years. And they tell me that this is what Kerala will look like. If you have the chance, go. It does not look like that. But there, there is a, an option to optimism. There's an option to planning. Uh, we saw quite a bit of it in the American Midwest. It looks something like that. Uh, if you don't plan for these changes, uh, you're going to have to plan to have water taxis or other things. So this is the part where I may begin talking a little bit more quickly. There have been three phases uh, in smart cities. The first one was driven by companies like my own, like Fujitsu. We have some really neat technology. Uh, we, we can do very smart things. And we went into cities and said, buy our technology. It will solve your problems. Uh, and Smart City 2.0, some of those cities are the government is also full of nerds, uh, sorry, of people who are very passionate about technology. So they would buy a technology solution and impose that on their citizens. And that, that still happens, it still works. Something like a citywide transport system is not something you do piecemeal. You need a stakeholder and a driver like a city to do that. So what we're looking at now uh, and finding actually works is Smart City 3.0. And that's where the citizens, where the users, where all of us, because we're all citizens. Uh, for all we have our own fields to work in, we're all users of a city. If something isn't designed by us, with us and for us, it won't get adopted. It's not enough for something to be more efficient. It has to be something that people want to use. Uh, because if people don't want to use it, you'll find your buildings are empty. Uh, you'll find the city gets deserted at night. You'll find crime builds. Uh, we have to go with with ourselves, we have to trust ourselves to create, to experiment, and to get those things out there. They may fail, they may fail quickly. If we don't get them out, they'll definitely fail. Uh, one of our colleagues today said to me, if you wait until something's ready, until you release it, it's too late. It should be out there already. So Smart City 3.0, co-creating with our citizens, is something we really have to think about. I'll talk a little bit about what makes up a smart city. Now, I realize this is taking up a level from smart building, uh, that these may not be things you see in a single uh, site, but they're all things that contribute to bringing information together for us. Uh, the figure of 10,000 sensors is, is, is misleading in two ways. 
One, because it's a year old, so it's out of date. Uh, we may be looking at cities that have 50,000 sensors, which have 100,000 sensors. And because some of those sensors you'll carry in your pockets, uh, they'll be your, uh, your smartphone. Some of them will be fixed to traffic lights, to buildings. Uh, and some of them will be travelling around on your buses, your trains and your taxis. All collecting information, all send them to a central point, or many central points, but they have to be an analysed. Uh, a friend at Toyota told me that one autonomous vehicle generates a terabyte of data per hour. Uh, if you have 100,000 <coughs> autonomous vehicles on your street, where are we going to put all that information? How can we deal with it real time? Uh, some things that I've seen working already are the garbage collectors one that's there at the top of the page. There's no point sending someone out to collect trash when the bin is only half empty. Why not wait until they're full? Sensor in the, in, in the bin, you automatically route your collectors uh, when they're needed, and all of a sudden you're cutting emissions, you're saving time, you're saving money. Uh, the data servers, we, fi we find that interesting because they don't have to sit in the one place. Uh, everyone talks about the cloud, and most people realize that it's not a cloud, it's someone else's computer. Uh, so it's having that smart cloud out there that knows the difference between sensitive data which you must hold securely, and public domain uh, data, which we want everyone to be able to harvest. Uh, I'll, t I'll talk a little bit later about taxis and buses and transport in general. Uh, the fact that we can use our gardens and parks more efficiently. Uh, I visited one of Tokyo's prefect prefectures this year. They've built a new town hall that has two stories of park. I think they're floor 10 and floor 12. Uh, it has grass growing on the walls. It's a green space, and it's paid for by 32 stories of apartment block above it. Uh, the mayor loves it. If you get the chance, go. Uh, he'll tell you all about it. Uh, trouble spots. Uh, I spoke uh, with a, a company from Detroit, uh, actually with General Electric, who are putting in smart uh, street lighting to Detroit. And the big selling point for it wasn't that you saved electricity. It wasn't that they switched on and off at the right time. Uh, it was because in each of those street posts they could put a gunshot sensor. And so the minute it senses a gunshot, it sent out a 911 call uh, and the police arrived immediately. Not something we're pushing in Europe, but it shows what a trouble spot is to some of these people. Uh, kind of focusing in a little bit on about what you do in individual challenges. So I... My, one of my personal interests is mobility as a service, uh, and it's how you make that happen with the users, with commuters, with people who are only using your city as visitors. Uh, you can collect that information from a lot of places. You can take it from your pedestrians. Uh, you can have sensors in vehicles, and it's very easy to put sensors in public transport. Uh, that's collecting the information, and it's fantastic, and it gets nerds like me very excited. It's what you do with that, putting it together, picking out trends and analysing it that you wouldn't see at first glance. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show you a slide in a second of what we were doing in Tokyo, uh, in the Shinjuku district. But one of the things we picked up was bicycle traffic, which is fairly interesting to us. It's not a big deal. However, a third party picked up on that bicycle information, mapped out where bicycle paths should be. Not where they are just now, but where they should be because people are using that route, mapped out where the dangerous spots are, and they now sell their own app to cyclists. It tells them adaptive per time of day, where you should be going, where you should be avoiding, and what's smart about your journey. We never thought of it. We wouldn't have thought of it in a million years. The street thinks of these things. Uh, so it's putting that out there. What works for a large company, uh, and probably just as well for a large construction company, is things like traffic management on a huge scale. We want to know how cities run. Um, giving telematics into vehicles. We work with Toyota, uh, and so your, uh, your sat-nav will show you real-time information, but it'll also show you localised information that won't come from a national system. Uh, getting that single ticket, the Holy Grail, which we're working on in uh, Helsinki just now, where you buy transport. You don't buy a bus ticket or a train ticket or hire a bike. You buy a certain amount of transport per month. And depending on how much you want to pay for that contract, 
uh, you can have taxis arrive at your door every day, or you can know that a bus will be there in 15 minutes. Uh, it's mobility as a service. Uh, and one of my favorite things is around about hydrogen management. Uh, I'll, I'll save that for when I come onto the slide, but just to say that in Japan, they're very keen on using hydrogen as clean fuel, uh, but that has the same sort of infrastructure issues as uh, distributing fossil fuels, as well as the cracking issues to get it there. So, uh, those are the sort of things that big companies look at. Individuals, co-creation, small users, they find their own use for these things. Uh, this is, normally at this point, I would, I would show a demonstration uh, because I love flashing lights and animations. Uh, we asked our Japanese colleagues to do a model of what we'll be showing for the, or using for the Tokyo Olympics in 2020. And they told me no. They said, no, we're not doing that because what we do in 2020 will have changed totally. So this is what they can do just now. Uh, this is what they can do in the Shinjuku area. And it picks up on those things I was speaking about earlier, uh, about the railways, uh, about what the road conditions are like, can you get a taxi? Uh, well, the reason we can track taxis is we asked uh, taxi drivers to use an app, and they said no. Uh, we said, if you use the app, we'll give you $25. And they took the $25 and they didn't use the app. And, <laughs> and we said, OK, have a mobile, have a Fujitsu mobile phone free. It's running the app. Well, OK. So we have, I think it's 10,000 taxi drivers for real-time information. And the only reason I've put this up here is because from that you can make smart recommendations when you have that data. You can see this is what you avoid, this is where you go. We can steer security teams between different events as they come out. Um, and if you're a restaurant who happens to use this platform, we can tell you when you'll have high footfall going past. And I know those are all things that are relevant inside buildings as well. Uh, again, just a bit of detail on that smart parking. Uh, we like to use, uh, instead of using sensors hammered into the ground, we like to use the CCTV cameras you already have uh, and apply some intelligence to that. So you analyze the data you already have. There, there, there's a theme coming here. We have that data. This is how you analyze it. Uh, it's, uh, although I don't like to talk about it, it's, it's, it's a revenue generator as well for cities. Uh, and also you can pick up people for fines because they haven't parked properly. You can do security uh, if someone's wandering around trying to park cars. Uh, where that goes to, uh, again, and this may be something we have an issue with looking at in Europe just now, there's no issue in Japan, is around about the surveillance. Uh, you can pick up vehicle types, you can track a particular vehicle, you can do facial recognition, things that we're only talking about for security applications maybe five, ten years ago, are now becoming available commercially. Uh, and one of the best places we find, or one of the smart places, we like to talk about smart places and not just smart cities, are airports. A huge amount of transients coming through each day, huge amount of workers working on site, and a lot of things that have to be tracked. Unattended objects, uh, assets, pollution. So we've deployed a lot of technology in there. Uh, I'd encourage you to look uh, airports as a model of a city, which you can take then as a microcosm for a building. Uh, the hydrogen management solution uh, I love because the idea that you can take offshore electricity, use it to crack water into hydrogen, and then use that to fuel your hydrogen buses and public transport, it's a perfect ecosystem. But you have to have the infrastructure to support it, so you need to think one step ahead. I actually got to hold the hydrogen filling uh, nozzle uh, and it's, it's like something from Ghostbusters. It's about three times the size of a petrol or diesel hose. Uh, but again, it's thinking what do people actually want to use? You want to know when you can fill up your hydrogen car. Uh, if you've got a hydrogen filling station, you want to know when you have to refuel. Uh, because this is popular in Japan, it's already deployed. It's not something new. Uh, and the assisted living. Uh, one of the things I like to see is technology coming from Japan where it's cutting edge, being used in Europe and refined and actually made better. So this is an example where we took some of the sensor technology coming in from Japan. We installed it in sheltered housing, uh, existing houses for elderly folk in Ireland uh, in a little town called Dundalk. And what we looked at there was working with the hospitals. We gave them the data 
picked up from inside the houses, and they used it for predictive diagnosis, not to wait until someone is ill and appears in hospital. You have to send an ambulance, you have to put them into intensive care, but to look for early signs. Uh, one of the great predictors of illness is your gait. It's how you walk. All of us have a way we do it, and it's standard. Variations to your gait can show everything from early onset uh, Alzheimer's. It can show neurological conditions. Uh, and you get to speak to people before this happens. Uh, as people get older, they want to stay fit. They want to stay in their own homes. And they want to feel secure doing those things. So we then took this technology from Ireland. Uh, and it's being used in the Netherlands just now in a sensor clinic where people's diagnostics are taken remotely. So you don't have someone coming around and putting a thermometer in your mouth every 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, you may not even be aware that your vital signs are being monitored. And again, it makes people feel more comfortable, but also takes care of them. Uh, I do get very passionate about this because we're all going to be living there. We're all going to be living in the future, if we're lucky. Uh, this slide was actually in, <laughs> in my deck before the events of the weekend. Although I love the technology, I love the idea that we're helping people, we are creating a problem. We're creating a problem because of all of this data that's flying around. Is it encrypted at point of use? Is it encrypted while it's been transported? Is it encrypted when it goes back out? How secure is it? The first photograph there is the San Francisco Municipal Railway, who were hacked the ransomware attack uh, last year. Now, they were able to recover. Uh, they didn't pay the 70,000 euros, which was requested. But for one day, everyone in San Francisco had free transport because the, uh, they couldn't make their machines work. They couldn't issue tickets for that day. The other story which hit the headlines was that a hotel in Austria, people had been locked in their hotel rooms and couldn't get out until the ransomware was paid. Now, that was nonsense. That didn't happen uh, because what was hacked was the PCs on the desks. So they couldn't issue keys. But the one reason why people were not locked in their rooms or locked out of their rooms was that they hadn't fitted Bluetooth locks yet. A lot of us are thinking of fitting IoT locks. They can be hacked. And one of my favorite uh, illustrations from uh, Fujitsu Forum was our teddy bear that you give as a companion to children in hospital. Uh, and it reacts to their emotions and it goes up and down and helps train them in that way. Uh, imagine if someone hacked your kid's teddy bear. I'd like to think about it. Uh, I'll speed up a little bit just now because now we're going to the area where you're experts and not me. And one of those things is the examples of where cooperation is already happening. Now, Tampere in Finland, I don't know if anyone's aware, are at the forefront of this with how they use the city as a stakeholder and how it becomes an enabler rather than a driver. Uh, I'd recommend the Organicity to have a look at that and how they use that as well. Uh, most importantly for today, start thinking about how your business, how your buildings are created with the users. Try and put yourself in their place and see what their user needs are. So these sort of questions will be asked by your user and you should think of them first. Uh, they're questions that you should, be think, you should be thinking of as an investor just now. How do you maximize that return? Uh, and as the operator of the building, all questions to ask yourself before you first put pen to paper. Uh, these are the things which are interesting to me from a technological point of view, the things that can become useful to you uh, when your building goes up. Think about them first, making the, <laughs> making the place smart. I love it when I walk into any Fujitsu office, I can put my palm uh, on the entry turnstile and walk through because the biometrics are set up. It makes life easier. Uh, and also, it's there to make business services work more easily, to make less of a barrier between the building and the people who use it. Uh, and going forward, you look at things like improving the customer experience, it's making savings. There's nothing wrong with making a saving, increasing your building value. Uh, and there are new ways of looking at uh, how you use an office building, uh, paper use, co-creation, melting pots. All of them are out there now, and hopefully we'll talk about it today. But the three points, if anything, to take away from looking at smart cities as a larger example of what goes on in a smart building, the change isn't optional. It's happening. 
uh, we either prepare for it well or we prepare for it badly, but we need to prepare for it. Change is no longer something that can be done to a citizen, to a user. It's something that has to be done with them because otherwise you won't carry the people who use the spaces. And remember, when we go away, that we are all users, we're all citizens, and we all have the right and the duty to co-create the environment we live in. Uh, and as smart cities should make living better and easier for citizens, smart buildings should do the same thing. It isn't enough anymore to offer efficiencies. You have to attract users into where, you're, uh, into where you want them to be. And that makes cities, buildings, places better for all of us. Thank you very much.